you to say some scripture with me. It's real easy. You're going to love this. By the grace of God, I am what I am. You want to say it with me? By the grace of God, I am what I am. Now, that will take on fuller meaning when I'm done. Right now, just kind of remember that's where we started because that's where we're going to end up. Oh, boy. I feel like singing. Where do I begin? So here's the way I am with you. This is how I am, and this is the way I am. I don't judge you. I'm not your judge. I deal with people of all walks of life, professional people, highly successful people, recording artists and TV personalities and prostitutes and the incarcerated and drug addicts and alcoholics and some things that the mind can't even go there. You, eh, how's that possible? But I don't judge people. And I'm always the first one to run to somebody's aid when I see their, they need it. There's never been a time when somebody has asked me for help. And there have been times when I've even probably learned the lesson I should have waited for God, but I rushed in anyways, wanting to help rescue that person. And if you remember, many years ago, Dr. Scott used to tell the story about how Pop used to go and try and save the same drunk. Do you remember that? Yeah. Well, that may be my besetting sin, because I think somehow if I'll just keep going at it, tenacious enough, I may be able to help pull you out of the burning fire. So, some of you might not understand, but I'm going to let this all hang out. There are plenty of people within the congregation and without, outside of this building. They don't even... They're not even an active part of this community, and yet I help them. And this one person, whom actually I said to you last week, last week's message was to one person, it was to that one person. As if, forgive me, but as if none of you existed, because I knew I had to speak to that one person. And Monday night, after Monday night's program, I brought that one person and one of my key staff people into my office to really begin to see how we can repair, begin repairing this person's life and begin getting them back on track. And a statement came out of this person's mouth. And I recognized it only afterwards as a very familiar demon. A statement came out of this person's mouth. It's, I mean, this is not verbatim, but the gist of it is that they are smarter than any of the staff people, and essentially smarter than me. Now, this is what's interesting, because until that time that that was uttered, I had sympathy for that person. I felt compelled that I should do something for this person, whatever, whatever is within my means. But once that was uttered, I've seen that demon before. I've, some of you forget, I have been around uh, maybe 17, 18 years, so I've, I've seen some of the resident demons that live here. And that's one of them. There was one guy here one time that said the whole ministry was raised up for him. You know who I'm talking about? Oh, yes. He used to be a musician, too. So put the two, two, two together and you have a great combo. It's a combination package right there. So I was really quick. Something sparked inside of me. And it, it really began settling in. It was one part righteous indignation. I even talked to my staff person afterwards and I said, Gosh, I'm not sure initially if I didn't have an ego reaction. I'm honest enough to say that, was that ego. But as I began to really process the whole matter, I realized this wasn't ego. This was looking in the face of a demon that has been here so many times, has infected so many in this body. Now, it becomes apparent in my retort to this person was your conceit essentially blows me away. Haven't you heard and don't you know that out of the mouth of babes, have I not said for weeks and weeks, oh, I'd love to entertain you because that's my favorite thing, to go and go to the board and write in plenty of languages. But if that does not bring something into your heart that changes you and only stimulates the intellect, 
then I am a failure before God, and before his throne I will have to answer, did I indulge myself blatantly because it edified me, or did I edify the body of Christ? And to me, there's no decision. If I have to choose between the two, I'm going to see your butts all the way to the gate of heaven, and the rest who want to be tantalized and entertained, they will be somewhere else. They won't be with me. seated. By the grace of God, I am what I am. I've never come to you in a high state and said, look at me, I'm better. I'm just as frail as you are. And don't let anybody deceive you that a person, man or woman of God, standing in the pulpit somehow should be this perfect thing, because there is no perfect thing. But out of this came something really great. See, God used that moment to say, I better warn the rest of you. We have spoken here many times about spiritual pride, but I'm going to use a synonym today to deliver a message to you which is a great caution on intellectual pride. Now, God is not anti-wisdom, and God is not anti-knowledge and anti-intellect. But when it becomes pride, and when it becomes lifted up... Now, I had to write this down, because I'm, there are many things that I have memorized in the Bible. Proverbs is not one of them. I don't spend too much time in Proverbs. The wise son maketh, a, maketh glad a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. And I had gone to that scripture looking for something to give me a handle because I realized the heaviness I had in my heart was, yes, this is a spiritual child gone completely astray. But then I began to reflect on how many of these that came before. You know, the ones sitting in the sanctuary that while I was talking, didn't have the spiritual bones in their body to listen and to understand that out of the mouth of babes, or let me put it in a more colloquial way, out of the mouth of a child, many things can be learned. I'm not speaking of a child. I'm speaking of a child of God. The simplicity. Why did Jesus take a child and say, see this child, except you become as one of these? Not high and lifted up except you become as one of these. And there's a few here in the sanctuary, because I can always, I feel them. They sit in here every Sunday. They analyze everything I say. Was it complex enough? Oh, that was too simplistic. Now, for the piece de resistance, before I start my message, here's what's so fabulous. I sat on festival, and the message I delivered out of what was on festival was out of Jeremiah, that King Zedekiah would not listen to the prophet Jeremiah, he was caught up in listening to false prophets. But yet he sent someone secretly to say, oh, and please pray for us. Not listening to the prophet, the ceasing of prayer, the essential hypocritical spiritual realm of things. And see, some people will hear that festival and they hear nothing. Oh, that's just... child could have exposited that. But a child of God listening will say, yes, I take the admonition because everything in this book is an admonition. Listen, you talk to God. I don't mind you giving prayer requests on the phone line. I encourage you to, but you talk to God. You listen to God's spokesperson, the one that God has appointed. Don't listen to the false voices, and we'll sort out true and false wisdom today. But... Putting all that matter aside, it dawned on me, I better, I better caution some of you. So rather than take the one who already committed what I think is the most egregious sin, it's the spirit of Miriam. God talks to me too. Who are you, Moses? 
It's the spirit of Absalom. There are all these interesting personalities, but this is the same spirit. This is the same spirit that someone who was here so dedicated began to be lifted up in intellectual pride. And I, I'm going to point out the difference between the spiritual pride, just a little shade, and the intellectual pride that says, I know more, and I am spiritually illuminated. I do not need to be taught. Do you know how many of those have been here and gone? And that shows you their level of ignorance, because it is the learned man or woman, it is the intelligent, it is the mark of intelligence that the more you learn, as you approach learning, you realize the less you know. It's very conceited for anyone here to say, well, I know every, every book of the Bible and I understand it all, and I can read it backwards, forwards, and upside down. Okay, then. Good for you. So open your Bibles to Romans 12, if you would, please, because the lesson is out of Romans 12. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Yes, that's not that scripture, by the way. I'm just having fun saying it because it speaks to my heart at this moment. Romans 12 is a great passage. You know, the whole book of Romans is incredible. We've, you could, essentially, Dr. Scott was right. You could have the book of Romans, and if you only had that and nothing else except the gospel records, and the book of Romans, you could do really well, you could survive, you could understand Christianity. The 12th chapter is this practical application to putting, if you will, putting into practice what has been learned, what has been received. And I'm focusing on, initially, on verse 16. Be of the same mind one toward another, mind not the high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Here is my text, be not wise in your own conceits. Now, the complaint from this person, by the way, was they wanted more teaching with language. So I'm going to accommodate you. I'm sure this person is listening. I'm going to tell you exactly what it says in the Greek. From the English, be not wise in your own conceits. Don't become an imperative verb. Don't become wise as an adjective with yourself. That's even better. That's even better. I really want you to think about this because this is not a one-time mention right here. We're going to encounter this over and over again. But I did jot down a few other English translations just for the fun of it because they, sometimes they just, they just pack just a better punch than the King James. So the New Century Version, which um, was designed for low reading skills, fifth grade, approximately fifth grade readers. New Century Version says, do not think how smart you are. Contemporary English Version, that version that came out of the studies of Barclay Newman in 1985 to determine how English was read and understood out of magazines and uh, how people received it. This contemporary English version, don't, wow, don't be proud and think you are smarter than others. And the New Living Translation, don't think you know it all. That may be my favorite one. Don't think you know it all. If you've got a 26 translation, you'll find a few in there too. Don't think too highly of yourself. And the same one here. Don't think you know it all. Now, if you want to hinge this whole chapter on something, it's not hinged on that verse that I'm looking at. Actually, the whole chapter would be hinged on verses 9 and 10. And I'll show you why in a minute. Verses 9 and 10, let love be without dissimulation. Literally, and I taught on this before, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good, be kindly affectionate one toward another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. 
And a little later on in this message, I'm going to show you that the very antithesis of what Paul talks so much about when he describes love, which people often miss, that great passage out of 1 Corinthians 13 that people always call the hymn or the song of love, they often miss this. In order to understand that type of love, that type of love is only understood after you have been brought low. Because he says, love, charity, love, King James, charity, but love isn't puffed up. We're going to see that if people are not careful with what they take into their minds, it actually becomes a weapon to be used against them. You know, a little knowledge, just a little bit of knowledge can be dangerous. When you didn't know, you know, pre the days of the internet, pre-internet, oh my goodness, <laughs> did I really say that? But pre-internet, you know when you didn't know a certain condition or a certain medical thing, you couldn't just go and Google it. So you were ignorant and you had to go to your doctor to find the answer. But now you can go online and, oh, that's easy, that prescription for that thing, oh yeah, that's what you need. You need to go ask your doctor for that prescription. Little knowledge becomes very disastrous in the wrong mind. Now, if you hinge this whole chapter on verses 9 and 10, what I just said, you're going to find that the angle is the common mind. The angle is being in agreement and being in harmony within the body of Christ, which I've said this from many different perspectives, the thing that's lacking. Imagine if we had the singers up here and we had just one person that failed to sing their part in a harmony. They were just singing their own tune. You would be, you'd be blocking your ears going, good grief, what is that? All the while, is it over yet? Is it over yet? Is it over yet? Oh, it's over. <laughs> but now apply the seriousness of this all. Because we, the body of Christ, we're supposed to be a body functioning together. We're not all an eye, we're not all an arm, and all a foot. Each has its own place. And supposedly, we're working in harmony, Christ being the head. And sometimes I think the body of Christ is this decrepit <laughs> praying mantis walking around, can't even congeal the movements that flow. Yes. So... You did not see that. <laughs> but I want you to get the picture because if we understand what the Apostle Paul is saying, be not wise with your own mind, he's essentially saying, hey, don't think too highly of yourself. Now, some people will take this message and they'll flip it and say, well, basically I'm supposed to self-abase myself. No, that's not what he's saying. Don't get puffed up in how smart you think you are. Now, how do you inflate something? How do you inflate a tire? You put air. Right. And how do you deflate a tire? <laughs> exactly. Thank you for the sound effect in the front row. I so appreciate that. Now, I want you to take, spin back with me to the 11th chapter because Paul is talking to a group of people as concerning the Jews and Gentiles. And he says, for I would, in verse 29, in verse 25 rather, for I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. You see, he likes to say this a lot, understanding how easy it was, especially for these, the church at Rome, and even the church at Corinth, he'll say this, don't be wise in your conceits, coming out of, by the way, I hate to tell you, coming out of Proverbs. Don't be wise in your conceits. That blindness in part has happened to Israel. He's explaining, hey, listen, you Gentiles, don't get all puffed up now in what you think you know, even though the Jews have failed for a little while, we're all going to be we're grafted on, and then he explains, as for the rest. But he says, don't get puffed up in what you think you know. And if you really want to understand why this is a big point for him, to not be taken away thinking you're so smart. 
from the voice of experience, as he was making his case before Agrippa and Festus, he says back in the book of Acts, chapter 26, and I believe it's the ninth verse, when he says, for I thought with myself. This is the problem with a lot of saints before they really, we'll call it un unregenerate mind. Some of it is backslidden, some of it's unregenerate, and there's a lot of people who've backslid. I thought with myself. In his case, he was thinking, making the case, Acts 20, I'm sorry, 26, and I think it's the ninth verse. Yes. I verily thought with myself I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This is the problem with people sometimes. They do too much I thought with myself. Too much self-discussion and self-orientation. And in Paul's case, he was very zealous for the cause that he stood for at the time. Do you know what spiritual, spiritual pride, I'm not speaking of intellectual, but spiritual pride is being very zealous. It's as if Satan opens that door, lets himself in, and that becomes the passageway for very zealous people who want to further the cause of Christ. They suddenly are in this level of superiority. They're above it all. You ever meet those people? Okay, wait a minute. Before I go there, you ever meet anybody who's so full of themselves that you just, doesn't that make you sick? They know everything. You can't tell them anything. In fact, they argue with you about how much they know. And there is another, wow, there is another mark of ignorance right there. A smart person, a really smart person, will listen to all the facts being presented. I learned this from my late husband. All the facts are presented. You never rush to judgment. You listen like as if you're in a courtroom. You are listening to the whole argument. The whole case is being presented. You listen to the whole matter. You don't judge based on this person's testimony on the witness stand. You listen to it all, and then you form conclusions based upon what has been provided in terms of evidence, what has been presented to you. Logical people come to logical conclusions based on that instead of rushing in and saying, oh, no, 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 no. Now, I've met a couple of those, and you just, no, no, no. Okay, patience is being exercised here. And spiritual pride is very much like an onion. You ever try and slice the top of an onion off and just lift back the first layer? And if you keep going, or if you push it from the bottom, It'll all come out like this, layer upon layer. And that's what spiritual pride is. It keeps, you never know how to get beneath it all. These are people who have been spiritually illuminated. They've received the truth. I've met a few of those. And it's the saddest thing because the scripture talks much about guarding yourself against this. I have preached probably more messages than I can count off the top of my head on this very subject. And yet still people, they just don't listen come back to the first statement I made. Listen, don't think you're exempt. And I think to myself, Paul's words in his testimony right here before, or his apologia before Festus and Agrippa, he was basically saying, yeah, this, this is how I rationalized. This was my thinking. This is how I processed the thoughts. I spoke to myself. And the self seldom, if ever, gives very good answers. If we're looking about God's way versus our way, the self is usually centered on one thing, the self. So the first thing I want to take a look at is how easy it is to slip into this um, mindset that Paul is talking about here. I, we were just in Romans. Um, but you're going to find this is a concept that's peppered throughout the Bible. So first, we need to understand something, because I don't want people to think, well, are you against learning? Are you against knowledge? Are you against wisdom? First of all, the great mistake most people make when they read the scriptures is defining certain things. Now, I used to have a person here sit in the sanctuary that used to say, you engage too much in uh, synonyms. You, you slice matters too thinly. Well, you ought to, considering that your language, your English language, yes, it's yours, 
your English language. That was spoken like a woman talking about her kids. They're your kids. Your language, English, is very young and is a language that has imported words from many different places. And most people are not familiar enough with certain terms that they just assume certain things become synonymous. But let's define something. Knowledge in the, in the, we'll talk in the exposition that I'm doing right now, knowledge is something that you open yourself to discovery, to learn, to inquire, to be able to, we have programs and things that you can learn. We live in the technological age where you can amass knowledge by exposure to it. Wisdom is the capacity to, and I have a definition somewhere here, I'd like to read it so I don't mess it up too much. Wisdom is the power and the capacity to use and apply your knowledge. Would you like me to say that again? Because you can be, you can have a whole lot of knowledge and not know how to apply that, which means you lack wisdom. Wisdom is the power and capacity to apply, we'll say it judiciously, properly, aright, that which you have acquired, that which the mind has received and imputed. Most people think, including this person that I referenced, they're pretty smart. This person, I think, actually thought they were pretty wise, but in fact, they weren't wise at all. They may have had a lot of knowledge, but remember what I just said, wisdom is the power and the capacity to apply the knowledge you've learned. So this is a person who needs deliverance, who needs help, who professes to know the Word of God, who is enlightened, but yet cannot help themselves because they refuse to understand the application. And this begins the realm of intellectual pride. I know all these things. Now, tell the truth. I'm looking for truth now, and you're not going to offend me, because I, I think I have a pretty good track record of seeing through a lot of the stuff people like to cover up. You ever sat here, and in your mind, you've, you've intellectually said, but I, I know all that. Show me your hands. Come on. But then the question is, you could have all that knowledge, and that may be true, but you may lack wisdom because you've never implemented the very things that you have professed to have learned, the knowledge you have certainly apprehended or taken to yourself. And there becomes the lack. There are people who are rich in knowledge and lack wisdom, and there are people who have great wisdom, power, and capacity, but they misuse it, and they they are so ready for the accolades and the applause that they become conceited and puffed up. So, I come back to this scripture. Be not wise in your own conceits and be ready to take the instruction, if you will, because the instruction has some real profound impact. First of all, let me say that intellectual pride, some people may not think this way, but intellectual pride was first introduced by Satan himself, pitting his wisdom, his knowledge, because he had both, against God. Now, I sometimes think that we tend to read the Bible and fail to, it's like having the best hand cream. You've got chapped skin. You can look at the bottle, but unless you apply the hand cream, your, your, your skin is still going to be dry. I think a lot of people are like that. They're, they have this bottle in front of them called the Bible, but there's never an application made, or they read something, and it's something so far removed from them. But isn't this what Satan did in the garden? And it's very subtle. Somebody says, well, how do you know that somebody has intellectual pride? It's very subtle. In fact, it's probably the hardest sin. Spiritual pride is a little bit easier to see. Usually it comes with some, a lot of telltale signs. The intellectual one is more, it's, it's easier to conceal by the one who walks around thinking they are such a great intellect. Now, back to my text. Be not wise in your own conceits. And we should... I should make this clear that a lot of times people may think that because 
we have two things that look rather very much the same, it should suffice. It's sufficient enough wisdom and knowledge. But look at the wisest man. He, Solomon prayed and asked for wisdom. Now, wise, a wise man such as Solomon, listen, you have to admit, based on the definition I just gave between wisdom and knowledge, it should be pretty clear. Solomon was very wise. Remember I mentioned how he discerned who was the real mother of that child? That's great wisdom. That is the power and capacity to apply knowledge. And that is, by the way, a gift. We can't say, oh, well, I acquired this. This is a gift from God. He asked for it, and God gave him that. This is the other thing we seldom we like to just race over. You may go to school to learn how to learn. You may go to school to learn an application of something, but it is God who gives the ability. It's God who gives the mind. It's God who created the mind. Now, some people, I think, they think they have created their own mind and their own thoughts, and they marvel at their own thoughts. Wow, that was so great. Oh, wow. <laughs> a great scholar and a great mind is a modest mind, is a humble mind. So, let's take a look somewhere else to make sure that I'm, we're not isolating a, a one, it's not a one-time doctrine here. Turn to 1 Corinthians 8. Because there is a theme that is being repeated here. 1 Corinthians 8, now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity, agape, love, Edifies. Knowledge puffs up. Love edifies. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. You see, what I'm saying is not a one hit. Don't think, oh, well, that's just some, you know, obscure scripture there at the end of Romans, and we don't have to think about this. No, this is a reoccurring theme throughout the scriptures. And you know what? I'm sorry. As I apologize to you as a congregation that I didn't do this sooner because it's almost like you, you, you need to get checked once in a while. You know, the danger of any person sitting and saying, well, I know this, but when you highlight these scriptures like this, there is some clarity. Now, on the heels of what I just read there, let me read it again one more, one more time. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity, agape, love, edifieth. If any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. Oh, let me read that th the third verse because it's so good. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. Okay, stop right there and turn to 1 Corinthians 13. Because this is what I want to demonstrate. When we become intellectually proud or puffed up, we become guilty of the very things that the, Paul, the, the Apostle Paul tells us in the reverse, we'll say, of love. So listen, 13, beginning at verse 4, and every time it says charity, we know we've studied this, it's love. It's the word for agape. There are multiple words in, in the Greek language for love. This one is unconditional, no strings attached, which can only come, by the way, from God, and only, by the way, out of this message, I'm sure of this, can only come when we are brought low, when we, when we have been deflated, then we understand what this love looks like. Love, charity, suffereth long, and is kind. I want you to think of the antithesis so when we speak of someone who is intellectually proud and puffed up, love suffereth long and is kind. Well, have you ever met a person who's puffed up with pride, who's kind? We're talking about the kindness that looks like Christ. No. Love envieth not, but a person who has intellectual pride usually does. That's why I said you can almost get it. It's a juxtaposition to show what polar opposite behavior. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. If 
but intellectual or spiritual pride is. I love this. Doth not behave itself unseemly, nor seeketh her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. If you, you want to start looking at this carefully, congregation, because it is a danger to any person sitting here who's been here for any amount of time to say, well, but I know that. And you may have a great knowledge and lack the wisdom to put your knowledge into your life, put it into action. That becomes wisdom carried out. Just remarkably, the behavioral pattern in its display tells me there are people that come and they have no love. I've said to a few people on a few occasions, if you don't like me, that's one thing, but I want you to love God's Word and love the fact that I love God's Word enough that I'm one of those that hasn't bowed their knee to Baal. Love that. I'm not asking you to love me. That's saying love the flesh and love the self. And if it's a byproduct that you can't stop that, then hey, I'm not going to stop you. <laughs> That'll hit some of you later but I'm not after that. Love, by the way, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth, beareth all things. Have you ever seen someone who's, who's full of pride, bear all things? They're the ones busy walking out on you. Or when the going gets tough, they're the ones that flake and run like this one. I told you I'm going to make a lesson. Every once in a while, you need to see my hand is on the pulse of this congregation more than you know. My heart bleeds for these people who are so swallowed up by the devil's trappings and they're so consumed, they can no longer see aright. I become the enemy. I become the person that is not trying to help them. Oh, I forgot, that's right. I'm the person that put you into a rehabilitation center or sent somebody to pick you up when you were drunk out on the street and nobody else could give a you-know-what about you. Don't talk to me about who you think I am or what I stand for for this congregation. I care about you, but I'm not going to let you get away with sitting arms folded and thinking somehow you have the license to critique me. Be not wise with yourselves. Do not think you've arrived in your knowledge. I haven't arrived in my knowledge. In fact, the more I learn about God, it humbles me to recognize. The more I think that I've learned, the more I know I have so much more to go that sometimes it's overwhelming. How could I not know what I need to know where I am? And, but I look back and I think, but I've, I've come this far and I've gained this much knowledge and I have implemented the wisdom, but I've got so much farther to go. Now that's the mark of someone who is humble before God, not thinking, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> yeah. You see what's wonderful? Sometimes you don't need words. <laughs> if you keep reading this, by the way, you keep balancing out everything that he says. I love what he says when he closes this chapter. And he said there was no chapter and verse, but as the chapter closes, in verse 12, he says, For now we see through a glass darkly, except for those few who have the uh, extra white tint. You know, the select ones that are intellectually proud and they know everything. For the rest of us, we see through a glass darkly. Yes? I am what I am, yes. And I'm not going to make an apology for it either. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. I want you to just kind of weave all this together. And, and the point of this is that a truly wise person is not puffed up. A truly wise person understands. I want you to try and think of the wisest person that you could think of in our modern times. And there were many brilliant minds with great knowledge and great wisdom. 
And if they wrote down or if they were interviewed, you will find something rather staggering. Read the life of Albert Einstein, and you'll find he didn't walk around saying, hey, peeps, I'm Albert Einstein. <laughs> Listen to me, because I'm the smartest man alive. <laughs> yes, I said peeps. Yes. <laughs> See, it's good to be real. I wish I would have reminded this person that pride, pride just has a way of rooting its head, and pride usually comes right before destruction. Yes, exactly. You'll never get to understand, and I'll never get to understand how, but this is how Satan reaches in. It's almost, this is the door handle he uses, and it works. So back to where I was here. I would go so far as to say, here's an interesting thing. I'm going to quote James. Oh, boy, I can't believe that. Wait, I want you to turn there if you can find it. <laughs> yes, I said that. Part of this, part of this, you know, if you read this carefully, there's some good instruction here. Three... And 13, who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Who is a wise man and, I wouldn't capitalize that, and, there's no capitals in the Greek, but I did that in my Bible, and, not just a wise man, but endued with knowledge among you. Now, of course, James, everything is the show of everything. It's the show of good deeds and it's the show of works and, you know, show me your faith and I'll show you my works and whatever else you want to show. But... <laughs> But he says, let him show out of a good conversation, good behavior, his works, with meekness of wisdom. But if you think about that, and don't go too far James in on me, but if you think about that, someone who has amassed knowledge within the scripture becomes wise in the acting of faith, or, or acting out, or carrying out, or living the faith, that is the knowledge that the mind has received. Does that make sense to you? Yes, so it's not far from what he's saying. And then, of course, read down because he says, but if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth, this wisdom descendeth not from above. Now that may be about the most profound thing that James says here. There is wisdom that comes from the earth. John, in 1 John, I believe, second chapter, talks about the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the world, the world, the flesh, and the devil. There is a worldly knowledge. We'll call it a, a, a worldly. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. Now, don't go church lady on me. But I really want you to grab hold of this, because... There's that mind that within the realm of, outside of the church, within the realm of learning, people of great learning and academia, they're highly heralded. And I'm not against education. I'm simply saying that there, there is that form of wisdom that is earthly, not from above. Because he goes on to say, for where envying and strife is, there is confusion tumult or unquietness, the margin says, and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and of good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. So I want you to put this all together because if you were to say to me, well, you started off with be not wise, with or in your own conceits. Be not wise with yourself. That's correct. If you were to look at elsewhere, it's the reason why James says, I now understand this, it's the reason why he says, be not many masters, or many don't try to be a leader, or many masters among you. Why? Because those people who want to be put in that position, 
who may not have what is from above will be held, he's right. It's almost like saying, if you think you, you are able, then you will stand before God being judged on your ability, and that's quite frightening concerning the things of God. But rather, if God has chosen a one, first book of Scott, whom the Lord calls, he enables. <laughs> Some of you weren't looking for that. It's okay. What I want to say is the caution, be not wise in your own conceits. Don't be caught up in your own ideas. Don't, as the, one of the translations says, don't think you know it all. Why? Well, the first thing you want to do is look at if there was a greatest, the greatest know-it-all of all times who came and made declarations that seemed so blatantly conceited, but they were seated and rooted in him because he was the ground and truth out of which all life flows, Jesus Christ. Apart from him, aside from that realm where he makes these bold claims which appear to be conceited, but they are not, you will find Jesus saying, take my yoke, learn from me. What is that scripture? Take my yoke, learn from me, Matthew 11. It's the test of our brains here. We'll see if you're all following me. Matthew 11, I want you to see it for yourselves. Matthew 11, at verse 28 through 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Meek, and we looked at this, we studied this one time. Meek, as in like a horse that has been broken, wearing bit and bridle. And lowly in heart, depressed or weighed down, which is the complete opposite of puffed up. Do you see what I'm saying? The minute the air starts to inflate, gas, wind. <laughs> you better go to the scriptures and recognize you are not greater than God. And you are not greater than God's gift to the church, his ministers. Now, that doesn't give the right or the license of the ministers to lord it over the people either. But touch not God's anointed. There may be a reason why you have to go back and learn a simple lesson. Tell me, how many of you, show me your hands, how many of you are married? How many of you are experts in marriage? I rest my case. <laughs> and if I ever left the pulpit, I would definitely become a lawyer. <laughs> I rest my case. Just because you're married doesn't mean you're an expert. In fact, it probably means the only thing you may have become expert in is how to grit your teeth. <laughs> and if you have a really good marriage, you've become an expert in something that most people never experience. Now. The gist of all this is to say, what does, if we're to not be puffed up, if we're not to think we are wise within ourselves, well, what are we to look at? Well, first, I'm pointing you to Christ. Elsewhere, he says that all the things that he possessed, the Father gave to him. We are to look unto Jesus. Was he puffed up or was he lowly? When he came here, when he walked in the flesh, was he lowly? We're not talking about whether he went into the temple and turned over the money changers. That, that, was, not, that was not a part of what people say, well, but that's not lowly. No, that's, that's all part of the Godhead in the flesh. But lowly, he didn't walk around saying, hey, I'm Jesus. <laughs> you know, they have Christian rappers. <laughs> I've never heard a couple of those. But anyway... Jesus didn't come into town rapping about how, you know, how fly he was. <laughs> Just got to keep it interesting here because some of you are going, okay, I'm, I will not be caught up in my own conceits. Good. So I want to bring this back down to where we are. So 
what can we do as an antidote? What can we do to prevent this? The first thing we're told in Scripture from the Apostle Paul is to you work out your salvation with fear and trembling, with phobias and traumas. That means you are not working out your salvation in a cocky, conceited, puffed up, hey, I, I know what I'm doing, but in humility, in, in phobias, in traumas. You know, there are certain things that I'm absolutely sure of because the Bible tells me so. There are other things that I'm, it's confirmed from the Spirit. But there are other things that I absolutely know, and I've never seen this to be otherwise. The people that get intellectually puffed up, you will find in their mind they have already worked out their salvation. And if you give them five minutes, they will help you work out yours too. Because <laughs> it only takes five minutes, really. The next thing is what the prophet Micah tells us to do. Walk humbly with your God. The minute you start thinking that your wisdom, the wisdom you possess or the knowledge you possess, is greater than what perhaps God is trying to give you at this moment. It's like saying, I, I referenced this last week when I said, some of you folks, you want fancy bread. You want rosemary, olive with special spices. And God says, hey, you're going to get white bread because right now that's what you need. God's giving you that bread. Take it. Eat it. That is what is going to sustain you. And all the, the add-ons, those are add-ons. They're not going to make or break your belly. But the main sustenance part, that what I'm calling that whole pure word of God, that is what feeds your soul. So to walk humbly with your God and then to recognize that not all wisdom is the same. As James pointed out, and I, yes, it's hard to believe, but I'm saying something James said, that not all wisdom is true wisdom. I said to you, knowledge is amassed. We, we take in knowledge, we're learning things, we're imputing things, and then here comes wisdom, the power and the capacity to apply that. But what happens a lot of time? People forget, even Satan could quote scripture and tweak the use of that which appeared to be knowledge. I can't emphasize this enough. Be not, be not conceited in your thinking about yourself. Now, someone will take this teaching today and say, okay, how do I safeguard? Well, the first thing is the scripture tells us you need to take heed, and I need to take heed, lest any man think of he, is, he or she is something more than they are. Take heed, lest you also fall. The potential is there for any person to become puffed up. But the intellectual pride and the intellectual puffing up, you just can't see it. Now, learning should be something of a tool. But the minute it becomes the device for Satan, you better look out. Now I'm saying, safeguard yourself. You work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Walk humbly with your God. Take these certain uh, things I've said, wisdom that comes from above. And I said, well, how do you know wisdom that comes from above which, versus wisdom that comes from below? Because James does say the wisdom from below is devilish, and I'd like to say that it's always the perverted people who take certain things that appear to be wisdom and turn it around for their benefit versus what comes from above. What does he say? It's pure and it's peaceable. You ever meet someone who's lifted up in intellectual pride, who is peaceable? They're ready to fight you tooth and nail for their, their wisdom that they have over you. It's their club. Remember I told you people are happy to come at you with Proverbs, and so I don't quote very often, the Proverbs, and they beat you over the head with Proverbs. It's a one-liner, it's quick, it does enough injury. You never know what hits you. So, I want you to take all this and safeguard yourself. We know that 
if we take everything that I've said and go back and reread that 1 Corinthians 13 and recognize that everything that Paul describes as love, which is actually low and not puffed up, the very opposite you can apply to being puffed up, intellectually puffed up with wisdom and knowledge. You can take all of that and say, this is the spectrum. This is not a message against learning or understanding, because God gave us the gift. He gave that to us. He gave us, he gave us the capacity to reason, to think, to understand, to learn. Just don't turn around and use it on the other people of God as if somehow you have been elevated to a position. Remember what I quoted last week? By the same measure that you are busy judging others, your wisdom, your sagacity, your ability, your judicious behavior, you will be judged. And not by me or by others, but by God. You're setting up your own bar for yourself at the judgment seat. So, it's my responsibility to warn you. You can't say, well, Pastor Scott didn't warn me. I know what the Bible says regarding these things. Christ, out of his mouth, he said, blessed are the meek, speaking of those lowly ones. Now, you don't try and act low. A truly humble man doesn't turn back. You've heard it quoted many times. He doesn't turn back to look and see, well, was I humble? Did I act with humility? You want to know how to keep your feet on the ground? When you think, just when you think your knowledge is reaching a new level and you're like an eagle taking off to soar, look back at all the fumblings in your life and recognize it was God's providential hand that kept you, guarded you, picked you up when you fell down the number of times you did and made an idiot out of yourself, restored you, gave you a standing, and then you realize you have nothing to be puffed up over because you're just... By the grace of God, I am what I said to you. I'm going to come back here because it says all of that to me. By the grace of God, I am what I am. By the grace of God, he brought me here. By the grace of God, he gave me the thought, the mind, the capacity, the understanding, the desire to you as well. So lest you become conceited with yourself and puffed up, check yourself, and then say with me, by the grace of God, I am what I am. You want to say it with me? Yes, by the grace of God, I am what I am. That's my message. <laughs> You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.